Are we back? Can you see the screen again? Perfect. Okay. Not sure where it got cut off by the power, but um, I think I ended with, I'm not here to lecture on path to entrepreneurship. Hopefully I didn't get cut off again. Maybe that was my sign. Um, but just here to tell a little bit about my journey. Um, but before I get started, I'm actually super curious, like with everyone who's sort of on this call today, are you, or do you consider yourself an entrepreneur or maybe in or within an organization, but I'd love to see you like just throw into the chat box, any company names, any organizations you're with. Like, I'd love to see who's here on the call. Yeah, it looks like. Okay, Connor, I see you're on here. I recognize some names. Yeah, Pathfinder 365. So a few people here locally in Saskatoon. Yeah, so a lot of people, Primerica, Adventure Tales, oh, amazing. Some people in the pet industry all over the place. So a lot of, a lot of people within and outside organizations. Why I kind of brought that up was as I prepared for this talk, I realized that I myself didn't really call myself an entrepreneur until a few years ago, really. I never thought of myself as an entrepreneur. Uh, my family was incredibly proud about working hard. So I was raised to work hard and I simply followed the example that my parents and grandparents set for me. So if you had asked me what an entrepreneur looked like a handful of years ago, I probably would have had that image of those smooth talking hustlers that went on to Dragon's Den and Shark Tank. And I think I somehow overlooked the examples of true entrepreneurs within my life. And when I thought about this, there were a few individuals that came to mind to me, um, which I'll share a couple of those. One, um, which kind of hit me when I was preparing for this was my grandpa, my grandpa Beck. He grew up on a Saskatchewan farm during the dirty 30s. He flew a Lancaster bomber in World War II. He continually innovated new products throughout his lifetime. And he had, he didn't even have a high school degree. I think he finished it in his adulthood. He did everything from building and installing solar panels on his small town Saskatchewan home during a time where it wasn't really even a thing. <laughs> to creating and inventing like new machines. Like I specifically remember this machine he invented to wrap up, like automatically wrap up and store extension cords with the pull of a lever. And then another example that came to my mind of just living under was my dad. And he was someone who was told he would likely never graduate high school. Uh, he somehow developed into this amazing businessman, this amazing family man, um, and a construction industry leader who ended up running a multi-billion dollar company. So both of these people led completely different paths, both led by examples. I remember them always saying, lead, follow, or get out of the way. And, and that's how they, they lived. So they both persevered through different hardships to accomplish very unique and different goals but I never heard them being called entrepreneurs. But now I look back and I realize that entrepreneurs can be inside and outside of organizations. So I was thinking of, okay, what, what drove them? Like what, what drove them to do what they wanted to do? Um, was it a love to learn? Did they enjoy challenges? Um, for me, do they love the lack of sleep that comes with trying to build something? And for me, I've always been driven by passion. And looking at passion, I know that's a vague word, but it was vague. It started off being vague. I remember that since day one, I simply loved animals. In grade four, I decided I wanted to be a vet because vets took care of animals. So that's what I worked towards. Simple, right? I wish. <laughs> So coming to kind of share a little bit about my path of entrepreneurship and how I took that passion of love for animals through what I've done to date, 
I tried to write down some cold notes of my journey and where I am now, which is my pet tech startup called Wagle Mail. So going back a little bit in time, um, I had to dig back and I sort of wanted to start my journey in, in undergrad. And reason being is around that time, I had on average three summer jobs at a time to help pay for school and to fuel my one of my initial passions, which was travel. So I was a broke student, but I still wanted to travel to new countries every year in between terms. I loved experiencing cultures, new food. So it fed a creative part of my brain. So there was that passion there and having multiple jobs facilitated that goal. So, and well, it did teach me a bunch of skill sets, but I was doing it because I had this passion for travel. One of these jobs was working for one of those typical like student work painting companies that we all see around with the, the banners on the lawns. And I found I have a passion for painting trim which a lot of people think is crazy. So I liked painting trim. So I saw the opportunity that I like doing something that lots of people don't like doing. People were making money off of me doing something that they didn't like to do. So I thought, why don't I do it myself? So my first company, House Lift, was born. And I started booking my own houses to paint trim. Another one of these jobs was working in a paper and shingle mill. And I was initially placed in the office to do pretty menial tasks. My uncle had gotten me the job or the interview. And I really do think he was just trying to protect me from like the rough, <laughs> the rough and the gruff. So I got stuck in this, this office. I quickly outgrew my duties to the point where I was eventually in charge of the entire purchasing and inventory um, department, managing a multi-million dollar budget over the summer. I was the only female in the mill. I worked in a 360 degree glass office in the center of the paper mill. And I distinctly remember that long walk from my car through the mill to my office and back or to the bathroom every day. It was definitely a little uncomfortable being a young woman in kind of this gritty male dominated mill. Um, but I was a tomboy, I grew up with brothers, had a dad who treated me the same as anybody else. So I just felt like I had to work harder to prove myself. I did like the challenge and I was innovating internal processes while I was there. Their purchasing system was pretty archaic and I could nerd out in my Excel spreadsheets and people just kind of let me do my thing. I felt like I was making a difference. I felt recognized and so I was enjoying it. Like I found passion in that. Um, eventually they did depend on me to come back every summer and take over the department so their full-time employee could actually go on vacation. So with that, passion kind of drove me to innovate within my role and to persevere through the discomfort that I had in this, this new role. So as a result, I did earn the respect and friendship of a lot of like tough looking dudes, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. So yeah. And meanwhile, applying to vet school, didn't get in into vet school after finishing my first degree at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. So I grew up in Sherwood Park and I felt like a complete failure. Like I was devastated. This was the first time that I feel like I really tasted what I thought was failure. Like I was a keener, had to be the best in everything I did. But looking back, it was probably one of the best things that could have happened to me. So I went into slight panic mode, but I always had a backup plan. So my backup plan was to go into business. So I started a business after degree, majoring in finance. Um, and lo and behold, I fell in love with finance and business strategy with another passion that I didn't know about. And I actually kind of enjoyed accounting, which was weird. So shortly after that and finding that new passion, I switched out my hard hat at the mill and I went for a much snazzier job um, in a little cubicle downtown Edmonton where I started learning about insurance broking and risk management. So I was enjoying the change of scenery in this whole new business world, um, not particularly the cubicle. <laughs> I wasn't in love with the cubicle. 
but I hadn't planned on applying for vet school again. I had found some other passions. Um, yeah, but then I was accepted. I got this letter in the mail and I was accepted into vet school. So I was like, well, this is what I've worked for my entire life. So I'd be stupid not to. So changed course yet again, moved to Saskatoon um, for the vet school here in Saskatoon. After another four years of school, I graduated and I made it. Like I graduated, I was there. I was a veterinarian. It was the thing I wanted to be my entire life. This was it. So I thought I had made it. <laughs> After a few years, I found I wasn't happy again. And I had lost some of the passion for what I was doing and why which was super scary because it took me over a decade to get there. And for the first time in my life, I quit a job without having a backup plan or any other jobs. I remember a lot of people thinking I was kind of crazy and the questions and the comments like, but you spent so much time becoming a vet or what a waste of schooling. Cause I did nine years of post-secondary education to, to become a vet like you name it. Um, my family and friends were supportive. They were rightfully a little confused as was I, <laughs> but I viscerally wasn't feeling, um, good doing that full time. I had lost, lost some of that passion. So I had zero jobs, but endless opportunities as a result, which I didn't look at then. So I think it, it was kind of looking back at that event. I remember my, I think it was my uncle who once told me that one mile of road has two miles of ditches. So to this day, I try to make those ditches count because you can't avoid them. Like they're there. So I was unemployed for a whole two weeks. <laughs> That's it. And I got a call from my mom and she said, Hey, I know you're not really working right now. It's stressing you out. Your older, you know, your brother, my older brother could use some help with his business. So she knew, I mean, being our mom, she knew I was structured, love numbers, love spreadsheets. And my brother is loving to bits, but polar opposite, complete polar opposite. And any of you who, who know us would, would probably laugh right now <laughs> hearing that say that polar opposites. So I drove from Saskatoon back to Alberta. So I'm in Saskatoon you know, as a vet, his business was in back where I grew up, Sherwood Park, Alberta. And I had zero clue, like zero idea what I was getting into, but I knew I needed a job and I was panicking because I didn't have a job. I'd always worked. So I pulled into his house, I think 10, 11 PM. And he disappeared into this room and came out tugging these huge rubber made containers, just stuffed full of papers. And to this day, I remember him just looking at it lackadaisically like, oh yeah, I'm three years behind in my personal and business taxes. And I just kind of looked at him, had a mild heart attack. Luckily he owed CRA money, not the opposite. And I got started. I started by digging in three-year-old receipts in Rubbermaids. And that was my career entrance into the automotive world, like automotive vehicles. Like how the heck did I get here? So what turned into quarter time, turned into half time, turned into full time, turned into co-founding one of the first digital automobile dealership and financing companies out there now known as Drive Financial. I knew nothing about cars. I knew nothing about trucks, um, but I was passionate about business development and I found joy becoming this controller and leading operations. I trusted my skills and my abilities and I applied those same skills and abilities to this world of trucks. And I think trusting myself became easier because I became more confident as I saw what I could accomplish just by applying um, different skill sets in a different industry. So at this time, um, I also founded uh, a full-time veterinary locuming business, which in essence, I was like a substitute teacher for vets. So I was doing that full-time in Saskatchewan, dealership full-time in Alberta. So doing both. This was not a cakewalk. I was living half my life in, in either province. 
um, and I helped develop the dealership over six years. And there were multiple times where we almost lost everything. Um, I remember lawsuits, CRA audits. Um, we used to sell trucks and then Fort McMurray had their fires, Fort McMurray oil crashed, you name it. Our customers went from buying 90 to hundred thousand dollar trucks loaded to having them repossessed and becoming subprime clients or looking for used minivans. Like everything was changing. So we never gave up. <laughs> There's a lot of hardships, but we had to innovate new directions. And now that company is generating eight figures of revenue. So just by taking different pivots and taking different things and turning them into opportunities, like you have to change and innovate to change. So I was doing this for a while and eventually I found I was losing passion for the company and my brother and I weren't seeing eye to eye as much. I wanted to come back home and spend time with family, not talk about business. And this was truly his vision. It wasn't really my vision. I had enjoyed developing, but it, it wasn't my vision. But this company was such a huge part of me. So I was like, well, what do I, then, then what do I do, right? Like, what do I do now? So I did what I do best and I started another company. <laughs> and I called it Treeline Finance Corp. And in the automobile world, this was considered a floor lining company which in essence, I leveraged interest. So took my finance brain and was leveraging interest to provide short-term loans for vehicles. I raised money by leveraging myself. So my savings, my home, I got a home equity line and I signed on our dealership because I knew the pain points and I knew um, that I could do better than the companies that were servicing us in that route. So there I was parallel to undergrad. I had three to four jobs at a time. And this is how I functioned. I loved being busy, creating things, fixing problems, learning. I was just running. Everything for me changed in 2019 when I was taken out by the knees by a catalytic personal event. I lost one of the most important people in my life. And I was forced to completely reprioritize and take things off my plate. I didn't really have a choice to take things off my plate. It just happened. So now I had the important decision of what do I put back onto my plate? And that was hard, like getting back to the, the vague feelings of what makes me feel good again, or what, what brings me joy, what brings me passion. So coming out of that, now entering the stage, came Wago Mail. And this was an idea I had probably over eight or nine years ago that I never acted on. And Wago Mail, this, the very first data-centric, veterinary curated dog subscription box that curates to every dog's age, need, and breed throughout their lifetime. This was a vision that I had and we still have such big plans on how we can innovate the pet tech space when we grow up. I'm now combining these passions I had for business development and these passions I have for advocating for the health and well-being of animals. Not, not a chance 10 years ago, I would have thought I would be starting a subscription box company. <laughs> but it's amazing that something like this, like these, these boxes are just this phase towards something that a didn't exist and is truly just fueled by my passion to empower pet parents and, and dog parents. It's something that didn't exist and now it exists. I would say it's honestly scarier this time around because all of the other times I, I built companies, I never really looked at myself as an entrepreneur. I was just doing my thing and I sort of fell into it. Like one door closed, another one opened. This is, I think, the first time that I purposely chose to put my whole heart, energy, savings, passion into this one thing that I really believe in. And I'm not even close to being done it yet. So maybe ask about my path to entrepreneurship in another three years and whether or not I think it was the right or the wrong way. But with that, 
Um, I want to turn it over just to conversation and questions and to thank you for attending. I did send over Wesk uh, a coupon. If you are dog owners, dog lovers, you've been watching our journey. There's a $40 off coupon you can use. I think it expires in a couple weeks. Um, but my contact information is there as well. So if you don't want to chat on this, this platform, feel free to reach out. Um, if a part of my journey resonated with you, or if you want more information about Wiggle Mail, yeah, I'm all ears. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to send it back to Emily. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for me? Well, actually, Christine, I was wondering, and I don't know if this is maybe too big of a question for this particular <laughs> presentation, but have you taken, um, it's always on my mind because that's where I'm at, but like funding, how, where are you, at? have you taken internal funding, or sorry, external funding, or aside from you won Go Money, I think it was, um, or you, you got some money through there, but um, what what's your funding path? Has it been seeking external funding or are you seeking to be revenue generated um, that kind of focus yeah to, so for me um this i'm a sole founder and i've bootstrapped this operation to date um but yes exactly that i, I participate in any event i can <laughs> to try to earn money towards the business so i did compete in the three to go money competition and and more so as well just for the practice to pitch right like that's something you need to get really comfortable with which i'd never done before like that was the second pitch i'd done in my entire life um and being a part of organizations like collabs has exposed me to various government grants that I never knew of. So that's been huge for me. So I have received, um, I think now 200,000 in non-dilutive funding to maximize towards um, covering, covering various costs. So that has been huge for me. So between those things I've been able to um, accomplish to date, yeah. But it's, it's such a personal thing, which I know you're probably saying, right? Like, it really depends on your revenue model. Um, I've been putting the majority of my revenue back into the business, right? But it's, I think it's really dependent on your personal financial situation, um, how quickly you want to grow as well. Like, that's something I'm kind of deciding on is I, if I want to do some of these things faster, I need more money to do that faster. Or do I go at a different pace based off of how how I can grow with what I have coming in. So yeah, I think it's really dependent on your, your, your goals and your strategy. Yeah, I agree. It is a very per personal journey, the, the financial one, how you finance it. Mm -hmm. it. It always starts bootstrapping, I think, no matter what, yeah. but yeah, you have to, but then deciding how fast you want to grow it. I like that too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and what your business model is too, does it have the capacity to get to a, a revenue generated point before um, you run out of that money? Like, can it can it get to a point where it can self-sustain for a while? And then, um, yeah, before you have to take on like angels or VCs. But mm -hmm. yeah, Debbie has a question there. And actually that's, I was curious too, what grants you did get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I would honestly lean, I find the organizations, like I'm pretty new to the business and tech community here in, in like Saskatchewan and it's amazing if you just ask people <laughs> like if you just ask people will help and I would honestly I didn't even know I didn't even know what IRAP NRC was six months ago or I I don't know where I would have been exposed to it you know so I think and I think you like I see what a lot of events like you expose yourself out to the networks right like you're good at networking so just ask people just questions like this right like I rep NRC is that a route that you can go what so is that what you got though is that where the 200,000 was that through I rep um some of them yeah okay yeah, yeah. that's For, what I was curious because I got a yeah. small project funding through them and that's mm -hmm. how I've been building my my MVP but yeah. um, it's about, I think, $50,000 is a cap. So I was just wondering yeah. if then you went to them for their larger, larger uh, project. I believe like 
I believe if you prove yourself, like I, I had to start with a smaller project like you, sure. right? Like I started with a smaller project. I proved that I used it. I proved that I accomplished the activities and objectives of that proposal. And then I kind of earned my right to apply for a bigger project. Okay. So I think that's, that's key. Like you, you have to, they're not going to, yeah, they're not going to give you money for free yeah. and they want you to use it. So yeah. use it and then apply for more. Right. And there's one funny thing about our, my guy, Daryl, he told me to, or, or actually I think Tammy said, they don't like it when you don't use their money. <laughs> so if you apply and get uh, a, a money funding from them, you do have to use all of it or it actually, it, uh, it looks poorly. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I'm still in the midst of, of finishing my MVP with my funding through them. So, so I haven't uh, I had to look for the, the larger, the larger scale yet, but yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. And I'm going to all, yeah. And you know where to find me, Connor. So I'll switch to one of the other, other questions. Um, let's look here. Scroll through. Uh, here we go. My curiosity is, here we go. Lapo. I, I'm probably uh, butchering maybe the enunciation of that, but my, Curiosity is at each stage of your pivots, what process or framework helped you know to pivot or iterate? Ooh, that's a hard question. <laughs> Which pivot? <laughs> is there, so question back to, to you who asked this, was there a specific one that you're curious about? Because I know I bounced around from a lot of different, different pivots. Was there one specifically in my story that resonated with you? All of them. Okay. <laughs> so, um, oh, at stage of your pivots, what process helped you know a pivot, know to pivot and iterate? I think ultimately, um, I trusted my gut. So, I think in all of these pivots, like, yes, they were driven by passion, but ultimately something um, in my gut didn't feel good. And I have a pretty good business sense. So when I felt like something was uncomfortable, it meant I either needed to figure out a way to make it feel less uncomfortable. And so it made me look at the situation and document kind of like write down, like I'm a big one who like scribbles things. So like put it down, like, okay, why am I feeling uncomfortable right now? Is it just because I'm scared? Is it because I don't know how to do this? Is it because I truly, I'm, I'm not making money and this is scary. So I think I listened to myself, my business sense, and I didn't have necessarily a very like formal framework or process that I used. I think I just outlined, okay, what's wrong? Why? What do I need to make this better? Do I think I can make this better? If not, pivot and go a different direction and let's see how that feels. So I know that's super vague, but I don't know if that answers your question. I wish I had an easy framework, but every time I pivot, it's a complete different um, reason, perhaps why. Yeah, and depending on my, my business goals or where I'm trying to, to go with it. So did that, kind of answer your question and feel free to D DM me if you want to have like a conversation about what you're experiencing. If you're kind of experiencing some challenges in your business, like feel free to shoot me a message. Um, yeah. So hopefully that answered your question a bit. Um, Toby, what kind of marketing strategy are you practicing? Are you relying on word of mouth, referrals, digital advertising, traditional advertising? Okay, this is a good question. Um, we have a lot of marketing <laughs> strategies. So we have multiple marketing channels. Um, so we are testing all of these, but we do have disciplined tests for each. So to answer your question, Yes, we rely kind of the main advertising channels right now that we use. Um, we have paid media. So that would be like Facebook, Instagram, um, Google display and search ads, 
We have an influencer campaign that we just started initiating. So that's a different channel. Um, we have an affiliate channel that we're building. Um, we do have word of mouth. We haven't pushed so hard on that um, until our subscriber base increases a bit. And then another one that I'm really excited about that we're really revamping is our email retargeting. So I would say those are kind of our biggest um, marketing channels. And there's other ones that, I mean, there's so much you can do. Like with our product, um, it's very product forward and it's D to C. So it's, it's direct to consumer. So there's a lot we can do. Um, so we have a lot started. We're testing some, but we're really deciding on which ones we should dig into versus just sort of spraying all of that. So we're trying to acquire some data to know which ones to dig into deeper and to really push. So those are the, the channels that we're using. Um, Laura also had her hand. Oh, did I miss somebody? Did I miss Laura? Uh, yeah, I have my hand yeah. raised. Okay, so my question is, how old is your business now? When Wago Mail is only a year old. Okay, so I have a couple of questions put together. It's good to know you're a year old and you're doing all those amazing things. Um, when did you scale? How did you strategize your marketing? Um, what would you advise a startup? How did I scale? Like which part? Like which part? Like, like the part where you said um, you've been able to get grants of up to 200. Mm. Yeah, I want to believe that you had things lined up and you had a plan on how to use that money and also make profit from it how how did you go about it what was your strategy yeah what was my strategy so um i would say my strategy was first coming up with a strategy and, and i leaned on people who were much smarter than me to help me create that strategy so I really took some time. I took a step back. Like I find when I know, at least for me, when I started, it was just go, go, go do this, do that, do this. And it's like, you're one, one woman show at first. Right. So you get pulled in 10 million directions. Um, and things were happening. I was testing things, was getting some traction, but I didn't have a strategy. So how am I supposed to grow or even hire people or like gain funding? Nobody's going to even look at me. I look chaotic. So I had to come up with a strategy. So I did um, find some mentors. So that was a big thing for me was finding people who knew what I didn't. So I ended up finding a handful of mentors and I really like chased them down to be perfectly honest and said, Hey, like, would you go for lunch with me? Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I would love like you're someone, <laughs> maybe not these exact words, but basically like, just genuinely being like, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm passionate about this, this, like I would just tell my story and what I'm doing. The passion was infectious. So then these people would sit in front of me and give me their time. So I did create, um, I called it my raise the roof, like growth strategy. That's what I called it. It's, it's my guiding North star. And I had my advisors help me sort of build that out. And it truly is a true strategy. So we came up with, um, and they helped me put these into words, right? Like I would say what I kind of wanted and they helped me put, put it into the, the right words, but, um, what are my KPIs? What are the things that I want to do this year? Okay. I want to sell a thousand boxes. Okay. What, what are the big bets that you think, how do you think you can sell those, those a thousand boxes? Okay, well, I think I need to increase my brand awareness. Okay, so let's break that down. How are you going to increase your brand awareness? I'm going to start an influencer program. Okay, great. So with that influencer program, what are your tactics to do that? So it's like taking, so rather than starting way down here and just trying to do these things, like take the time. Like I, I stood back and I think I, I spent a whole month on this, like in January, I, I, I didn't even have ads going. I just spoke to my customers and just strategized, found people to help me put this picture together and this roadmap. 
So that's what I did. And that's kind of what I follow to see if we're on track. And then that helped me figure out who I need to help perform these tactics, how much money I need to pay for these tactics, um, what I need to do before I can do the next thing, and then choose a priority of the tactics. So I'm not trying mm -hmm. to do 10 million things at once. Let's focus on this because I think it can lead to this. Mm -hmm. So I think that coming up with a strategy and finding people, um, and yeah, and a lot of people will give you their time, like, and I'm willing to give my time. Like, I know how helpful it was for me, but yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. Thanks, Christine. I was going to ask if you're willing to give your time when you just answered it. <laughs> yeah, like reach out to me after, like, if there's anything, I don't feel like I know, <laughs> like, whatever I can assist with, but I mean, that's, that's how I, yeah, I can't imagine doing it without the advisors, mentors that I've had. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, Debbie, when you speak of networking, what organizations did you and do you connect with? Um, you know, networking is a funny word. I think that's like a business word for just talking to people. <laughs> you know, like just talk to people. Like it's, it's amazing where you get just meeting people. Like I see so many familiar faces on here just from starting a conversation. Like Natasha, I see you on there. Like, I feel like we just met at a random event and we were sitting beside each other and I just started talking to you. Right. Um, but I'd say formal organizations, um, collabs has been huge for me. So the, the co-launch collabs community. So Wagomel is a part of their co-link um, tech incubator program. So that was a big one for me to get introduced to. Um, Srita, I just searched kind of events, really was out of necessity for funds. I searched events like Srita um, to see what kind of opportunities there were to, to go to. Um, what else? WESC has been great, obviously. Like we're all on this now and have made these connections. Um, yeah, I think that would be the the main ones and then just talking to people and then asking them if they know somebody who's in this industry and then usually you can get sort of introductions in that route. Yeah. Um, do you have, oh, <laughs> startup team to you. <laughs> I see Connor throwing that out there. Like I, I need to, I, yes, startup team to you. I, I need to uh, come to one of those events. Um, do I have an internal marketing team? Um, do I have an internal marketing team? So I have a small team, I have a small team, small, but powerful team. So now my team is, I was super excited. We actually had all of us. So we're a mix of local and remote. So there's about six of us that I would consider kind of our, our core team right now. Um, and Marketing wise, I have a fractional CMO. So um, she is sort of the overseer of any marketing strategies that I kind of come up with. So I have her on board. Um, and then internally, it's kind of a team effort because we're a small team. So I wouldn't say I have like a marketing manager or um but I have certain people that do certain parts of that role. So I, for example, have a contractor that is the lead for the influencer program. And then I have a front end designer that is in charge of, um, and copywriter that's in charge of approving anything before it goes out. Um, I have an agency that runs my paid media account. So I have a mixture, but it's not all internal. I can't, unfortunately afford it yet to have an internal. The dream is to grow big enough to have all of these roles in house, of course. Um, I see that's all questions. I think we have a few more minutes. Anybody else have any other questions? Looks like Connor listed um, some other examples or some other places you might want to check out. 
Saskatoon Chamber, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan Chamber, and NSBA hold regular events too. So awesome. Well, um, I don't know if you want to hear me talk anymore. <laughs> Bring Emily back. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Christine, for the informative presentation and conversation. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, as a reminder, you will be able to view this webinar on demand on our website by the end of the day today. Um, our next webinar is called Queer 101, um, Introduction to Identity, Terms, and Allyship, and that's presented by uh, Wendy Lee of Out Saskatoon on August 10th. So if you're interested in that, then you can sign up on our on our website. And yeah, with that, I'll say goodbye to everyone and have a great afternoon. Awesome. See you, everybody.